One, two, three. <laughs> it's hard to imagine a media more catalytic than television. He's won a million dollars. Since its inception, television has become an invaluable part of everyday American life. I made the football team. It has entertained us. Oh, I finally have a real son. I finally have a real son. Informed us. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I have a dream. You will remember this day as long as you live. And yes, occasionally tried to sell us something. Where's the beef? But above all, I pronounce it connected us. That they be man and wife together. Across distance and cultures. This was especially true during 2020, when the entire world was forced to stay inside our homes due to a global pandemic. When life went from this to this. Hi. And when we were all plunged into the unknown, we relied on television more than ever to help us navigate our new normal. The Television Academy is known for recognizing excellence in TV. Holy smokes! But we also believe that television has the power to change minds. In 2008, we created the Television Academy Honors Award to recognize shows that both create awareness and offer themselves as a catalyst for change. This year's honorees examine some of the most troubling matters we face today, casting new light on issues both endemic and emergent. These programs are a remarkable example of what television can do, enlighten and motivate us to take action. Tackling such topics as police brutality, immigration, sexual assault, the risks of social media, the climate crisis, the criminal justice system, and the brutal persecution of the LGBTQ community. Although these issues are not new, they were brought to a new light this year. So I had watched an episode of Master of None called Parents, and it was an immigrant story. And I thought, what if there was a show where every episode was that? Why does that have to be kind of an outlier? And I contacted my friend, Josh Behrman, who started this company called Epic Magazine. We'd always want to do something together. And he said, well, we've actually been looking to do some first-person photo essays, and what if we did them about all immigrant stories? So that would be amazing. Little America is an anthology series, and it's based on true stories of immigrants. And every single episode is a completely different tone, a completely different story, a completely different character. So one episode, you're dealing with the Nigerian experience, and the next episode, you're dealing with the Chinese experience. And our stories have come from all sorts of places. It's, you know, sometimes through people that we know, sometimes it's someone you meet, you know, who's your Uber driver, and you start talking to them, and they have a really interesting story. Dad? Mm -hmm. What's precocious mean? Look it up in a dictionary. Where's a dictionary? Up there. I got that dictionary when I first came to this country. Whenever I didn't know a word, I would look it up. And once I learned it, I'd highlight it with a marker. It doesn't look like you learned many words. Just look up your word, eh? Of a child having developed certain abilities at an earlier age than usual. Oh! I saw a kid changing for Jim, who might be precocious. The whole thing of Little America is to make it as accurate and kind of layered and textured as possible. It was important to us to involve not just cast that were, you know, from these places and these countries and had an authentic understanding of what that culture was, but also to involve as many people behind the scenes. With the writers and directors, we wanted to make sure that everybody had a real passion and connection with the material. And, and that, I think, really shows, you know, there were the people really brought themselves. They really poured a piece of, piece of themselves into each episode. I remember Zi Chun telling me the story. He directed an episode about his mom and she had a really, really traumatic childhood. And Z, as we were crafting the episode together, felt a lot of nervousness about, like, this is my mom's life, and actually it's my mom's trauma, and how is this gonna feel? And he showed it to his mom, and she sat there, and she finished the episode and just burst into tears and sobbed and had a big cry, and then walked out of the room and came back in and was like, I love it. I think 87% of the people 
in the kind of the creative part of the show were either immigrants themselves or children of immigrants. All of those little details kind of go into the stew and that's what kind of made the show what it is. The show isn't political in any way. I think the fact that it exists is the statement. No matter what side of the immigration debate you're on, people get a similar image in their head. And we wanted to show that there is no one image that you should get in your head. Immigrants look like the world and there are all different kinds of stories. So for us, expanding the definition, at least in people's heads, of what the immigrant experience is, is, is essential right now. The show felt like an incredible opportunity to just look at this experience as a human experience and a very American experience. And so it was exciting to kind of have this act of resistance that was actually just in telling these funny, warm human stories who also happen to be immigrants. We all want the same things. We all want love, we all want family, we all want to feel safe, uh, and we all want to be happy. What's your shoe size? You gonna need a pair of boots? No, I don't have any more money. Well, I didn't ask you about money. I know it don't look like it now, but I understand I've been there. Fern, won't you give him them pair of boots I brought in here and left last week? Might be a bit big on you. Yeah, will chafe him heels like crazy. But if you soak them in a tub of water, they'll draw up. You are too kind. And don't worry. Boots cannot hurt me. <laughs> what was really exciting was the global reaction we got. I would see people talking in different languages on Twitter and I would translate to make sure thing. what they thought. And, and that was really, really immensely satisfying and people talking about how authentic, you know, the languages were, the food were, the, the cultures that were portrayed. Probably my favorite aspect of launching the show was seeing these actors that I felt like had been working for a really long time and were so talented but hadn't had this kind of opportunity and watching them get the kind of attention and recognition that they deserved. That was really exciting for me. But getting the feedback that they liked the episodes, that they cried, that their families are responding to it, like that was that was kind of the best part of this whole thing. As storytellers, that's your big hope that movies and TV can be empathy making machines and give you insight into someone else's experience that is not like your own. And it's very affirming and beautiful when you're recognized in some way for putting that work out there. And that's what we hope to do as storytellers. And I think I'm really proud of this show because I feel like we succeeded in that. The most you can ever hope for is that something you make touches people in some way. Um, and I think having any small part of, of something that, that people find touching, that people find moves them, that people find entertaining as well, is really beautiful. And it's, it's kind of the best you can ever hope for in your career. I grew up in a hippie household where we had no TV when I was a kid. And then when I finally was allowed to watch TV, I was allowed to have two hours a week. And a whole hour of my two hours was spent on Dallas. I watched a lot of things that my grandmother watched, like soap operas. We had Trouble TV where I watched all of Kenan and Kel, Moesha, Monique. I watched The Golden Girls, Seinfeld, Every Loves Raymond. The Simpsons. I had a friend of mine who uh, had cable television. So we used to go home to his home and watch like Nickelodeon. What was his name in English? Like SpongeBob uh, Square Pants or something. That was like the most American television that we grew up to. Welcome to Chechnya tells the story of an ongoing crime against humanity that's taking place in the south of Russia in the Republic of Chechnya. Uh, since 2017, the leader there, Ramzan Kadyrov, has declared an official campaign to identify and round up and uh, eliminate all LGBTQ members of the Chechen minority. Когда это все начало происходить, потому что мы все понимали, что это катастрофа, что это вопрос о спасении не двух-трех людей, а сотен людей. These crimes have just continued ever since, and that has left it to 
a very small band of activists in Russia to take matters into their own hands. Нужно было людей скрывать, потому что на них велась охота. So welcome to Chechnya is really their story, the story of this underground network of heroes, really, who are in a way reminiscent of the ordinary citizens that stood up to defy Hitler uh, so many decades ago. Сейчас мы начнем заниматься экстренным переселением и постараемся вовлечь международное сообщество. They're building this network of safe houses. They're rescuing people by hand. They are converting their entire lives into this perilous existence. In order to do what they can to rescue the victims of this genocide and this atrocity. We had to work really strategically to make sure that our security protocols were such that nothing we did as filmmakers could have any negative impact, and that was really very essential to me. It meant that I couldn't work with a typical documentary film crew, I couldn't use a, a professional camera, I couldn't use lighting or a sound engineer. What we used was a, like a tourist camera, a handycam, as our principal camera, and uh, an iPhone as our second camera. We were very careful with that footage to make sure that if we ever lost control of those devices, that no one else could access the footage. We made sure not to move anything across the internet. We knew that the people who were after us were state actors. So we created a system that was entirely air-gapped, entirely sandboxed. Our encrypted drives were carried by hand across borders, and they were delivered to our studio, which was off the grid. And we made sure that no one brought any internet-connected devices into the edit room so that we could feel confident that at least the threat of digital invasion from Russia was prepared for. This was a very risky undertaking, um, not just for me as a filmmaker, but for the people who invited me into the shelter. The very idea that I might be traveling in and out of these secret locations could bring attention to them in, in ways that would um, undermine or or even, maybe even blow the operation. У нас не было такого опыта, что нужно же людей скрывать, нужно их искать им визы, какие-то пути, тайные вывоза из страны. Their first proposal to me was that I could film them in dark rooms or in shadows or wearing hoodies. And I said I I, I really wanted to see that their humanity. I wanted to witness their journey, which is something I felt I, I needed to see their faces for. Некоторые общаются, думают, что можно созвониться, услышать голос родных, вообще поговорить там на своем родном языке. А я-то не могу уже. I promised them that I would find a way to disguise their faces, not really knowing what I would do to do it. Ultimately, what we turned to very kind of unexpectedly was the same technique that's used in deep fake, which is the harnessing of artificial intelligence to take one person's face and merge it in with another person's face. So the people that you're seeing in the film are saying the things that they said when I saw them and first filmed them. They are responding exactly the same way. The difference is that we've mapped over their faces, the faces of 23 other people. They understood and saw the situation that the Czech government is aware of the fact that they will do everything to make sure that this will never happen. And to change the situation can only a person who has gone through these attempts and will say this publicly. But they understand that as soon as they open their mouth, the Czech government will start looking for them everywhere, wherever they were. Maxim, who is the hero in the film, is still pursuing his case against Chechnya. He filed the first criminal case, naming the people who tortured him. Uh, and that case was thrown out of Russian courts, but is making its way through the European courts for human rights. Нам действительно удалось объединить практически все существующие на сегодня ЛГБТ организации в мире для того, чтобы 
заниматься эвакуацией людей из России. We partnered with BBC News Russian Service to bring it out as not as a film but as a piece of news on the news service. It's the first time that BBC News Russia made such an acquisition. And so for the last five or six months, the film has been available to every household in Russia. Uh, that includes Chechnya. There is ongoing diplomatic work to try to address what's happening there. There have been two or three rounds of sanctions out of Washington um, that are further turning the screws against the Chechen leadership uh, to the point where they have often now in Chechnya complained about the sanctions, the way they're impacting life and economy there, and said that they are based on the falsehoods of filmmakers. So they're clearly linking this to the uh, to Welcome to Chechnya in a way that recognizes, I think, that the, the film itself has really been a catalyst to get that kind of change going. This recognition is, um, is you know, by far one of the most moving um, moments in the life of this film. I think it speaks not to us as filmmakers. I think it speaks to the people in the film. So it's, it's in their name uh, and the names of the people who didn't make it um, out of Chechnya and are still suffering there, uh, that we have received the award with gratitude. Looking back on the shows that inspired me, Hill Street Blues, St. Elsewhere. I was an early adopter of the real world. I learned so much about HIV from watching that show. And weirdly, I've since met two different people who got into AIDS work from watching that show as a kid. There were so many TV shows that I think influenced how I saw the world. Knight Rider, for instance, encouraged me to figure out how to solve a problem. So did MacGyver. You know, I always felt like no matter what was happening to you in life, there was always a way that you could figure things out. All you needed was a, a bit of, you know, fishing line and, and like an empty glue stick and something could happen. And I don't know, you know, shows like that made me feel like you could overcome obstacles. Her life is inspired by the true story of Isaac Wright Jr., an innocent man who was sentenced to life in prison. While he was in prison, learned how to become a lawyer and started to represent himself and fellow inmates, find justice. Hey, you were innocent. You were overcharged. You've done time you never should have. We're gonna end that. The life is, is Isaac. It's, he's the, the source of all of the information that was put into the show. Well, life is probably one of the very, very few where the content itself is a call to action because it's grounded yeah. uh, in, in reality. How are you here? Hard work and goodwill. What's your method? For him to support the idea <laughs> of him being able to get himself out after receiving 70 years plus life. Most people start to say to, to people on the outside, you need to move on. And he continued to defend himself because he was innocent for seven years was incarcerated and at points he worked for other inmates as a jailhouse attorney and ended up creating new case law through their, through their cases that actually benefited his case. So if he was just concentrating on himself, he would have never really created the case law that, that got him out. One of the things that is not so well known is really what it does to the families that are, that are left behind when someone is incarcerated. We spent a lot of time on that in the show and it, it puts a much more human face on it. And I think people understand um, how tragic it is when the system goes awry. You okay with these grades? Kids have ups and downs, Aaron. She quit gymnastics. She looks exhausted. The last time I saw I'm damn near sure she was stoned. She's not stoned. Something's going on, whatever it is. You saw me, right? No, it's on Darius. Come on. He's not hard enough on her. He's not her father. Well, if he's not willing to take on that responsibility, maybe he should get out of your bed. Well, I might kick him out if he came back home, but you're not, because you're locked up for life. Our show came around at the right time where people are ready to hear these stories and look at things in a different way. If it had come around maybe five years previously, there may not have been an appetite for it, but because criminal justice reform has been a topic of discussion, not just amongst progressive 
activists in circles, but politicians on both sides of the aisle talking about it in a very substantial, meaningful way. There's no question the system's broken for anybody who doesn't have power or money. Overcharging people who can't afford a lawyer, then force them into a plea? It's an epidemic in this country. I went through a number of different stages. Before I met 50, I didn't talk about what happened to me at all. Even within the family, we never even spoke about it. You know, it was, it was just something that happened that was so tragic that you never wanted to relive it. You know, once it came out, I saw not just the inspiration of it, but I saw how the story itself was inspiring other people and how it was, it was pushing them to continue to fight. I mean, I, emails, phone calls. Television has the power to really transform and help people think about things differently, think about other people's lives differently, perhaps even empathize with people, be more compassionate about stories that are different from their own. And I, our show hits all those marks. The fan reactions that have meant the most to me, and we get a lot of reaction from people who know people or family members or friends who were arrested or incarcerated or wrongly accused. And I have such a profound respect and admiration for Isaac. I just feel you know fortunate to have met him, to have his story come my way, to be given the opportunity to be part of telling this story about, you know, this subject matter that's so important. It's, it was an honor and such a gift to be a part of, of the show. For me, my fight was my fight, but the actual fight against the system was the things that I was doing for other people that were wrong. And so this award, you know, it's a vindication for everything that I, that I went through, for all the things that I, you know, I've done from the time I was in prison, you know, to today, even when I was in law school, I, I did 3,000 hours of pro bono services which means that I was either studying or helping people. This award, it epitomizes, you know, this incredible journey that I've gone through to ultimately bring me in front of him in his office and have me sit here in front of you. It's a really incredible moment for me. I got engaged during quarantine, so I watched 18 seasons of Real Housewives of New York. During the quarantine, I did almost television research. I watched all of Netflix. Yeah. I binge watched Rome. I binge watched Game of Thrones. I watched The Crown, great show. Uh, I watched Fleabag, um, was one of my favorites. Ozark, and some of the foreign shows have been great. Lupin, Borgen. What I want people to know is that everything they're doing online is carefully monitored and recorded. There's entire teams of engineers whose job is to use your psychology against you. We went into the social dilemma with this question around what is our technology doing to society? And I think the big realization here is that there's this hidden story behind social media that the public isn't fully aware of. And our goal was to really reveal the algorithms that are operating to manipulate us and kind of uh, change or alter our behaviors, our perceptions, um, and really the way that we see the world. If technology creates mass chaos, loneliness, more inability to focus on the real issues, we're toast. This is checkmate on humanity. Even though a lot of us knew that social media wasn't all good, it was some good, some bad, now we're all talking about it, and we've all seen what it, what it can do. The saying goes, if you're not paying for the product, then you are the product, and I think that, that was really sort of the, the basis of how, how do we follow this story. Gen Z, the kids born after 1996 or so, those kids are the first generation in history that got on social media in middle school. A whole generation is more anxious, more fragile, more depressed. They're much less comfortable taking risks. The rates at which they get driver's licenses have been dropping. The number who have ever gone out on a date or had any kind of romantic interaction is dropping rapidly. There are some friends of mine that I went to college with that worked in the tech industry and it was about four years ago where I started to see them talking about the unseen consequences, the manipulative design techniques, 
uh, kind of the darker side of social media and how is it changing the lives and shaping the lives of billions of people all around the planet. We look at these platforms as, you know, fact, as information, and actually it is not that. It is driven by an advertising business model that is meant to profit off of us and our time as opposed to giving us information that really is um, necessary for our lives. We're training and conditioning a whole new generation of people that when we are uncomfortable or lonely or uncertain or afraid, we have a digital pacifier for ourselves that is kind of atrophying our own ability to deal with that. At the start of the project, it was pretty hard to get people to want to speak on the record. I do think a lot of the tech insiders felt a responsibility to share their story and to share what they knew about how the technology was designed, how it was built, how they helped build it in some ways. It shouldn't just be the engineers within Silicon Valley that understand how it works. They wanted to elevate it to the public. I don't know any parent who says, yeah, you know, I really want my kids to be growing up feeling manipulated by tech designers, uh, manipulating their attention, making it impossible to do their homework, making them compare themselves to unrealistic standards of beauty. Like, no one wants that. We knew from the very beginning it was gonna alternate between these talking head sections and some kind of live action. I think that is why it resonated with so many people and why people engaged with the film in such a deep way because they could see themselves in it, they could see a family in it, they could understand and get insights into what we were learning from the engineers through these visual analogies. Our goal with the film was really to spark a conversation around these issues, both with the users as us, general public, as well as with policymakers, and hopefully this is just a launching pad for a lot of other organizations to be able to do their work. I think The Social Dilemma really is an offering to the movement and to this community that's just trying to make change in the world and trying to reshape the role that technology plays in our lives and in society. This is the front page story, right? This is the story of our time. This is a technology platform and, and these systems of technology that have been built that are shaping our civilization, like it is that big of an idea. I think that there's big opportunities for us as a nation and as a world to really think about how these technologies are influencing, especially how they're changing our brains, our mind, and the way that we operate. Filmmaking is hard. We all know that filmmaking is hard and telling these stories and getting it out into the world is, is a really challenging endeavor. Um, but to be recognized just gives the, the inspiration and the fuel to keep going and to keep doing the work. I was taken uh, entirely by nature programming. Jacques Cousteau and even the dramatic pieces like uh, Sea Hunt converted me to a sense of wonder, I think, about the universe and an understanding about the power of television. Watching Lost for the first time was one of those like mind-blowing, I couldn't even imagine the entire world that was built and created and the excitement and the opportunity that comes through creating a show like that. I think that was probably one of those early influences where I was like, this is, this is a really awesome medium. I May Destroy You is about a writer who has her book due and on the night before her deadline, she goes out to see her friend and her drink is spiked and she's sexually assaulted. So the show is 12 episodes of everything that can fall out from that situation. Bob probably does think you're crazy. He thinks this is all a little uncalled for and this personal space thing is all going a bit too far. And he's very confident in his view because he's gone exploring to see for himself what boundaries and violations these women might be banging on about because Bob's thorough. And on these explorations, Bob found the line that separated him from everything else. Rather than crossing it, he tiptoed on it. And he experienced this feeling of being on the boundary, on the border, right on the line. The motivation for me writing was definitely about me trying to figure out something that was quite shocking to me still and in a strange, painful way it was fascinating. 
I wanted to understand my own sexual assault. It's based on something that actually happened to me and maybe to try and shrink it so that it wasn't bigger than me anymore. And along the way, I learned through meeting people and talking with close friends and even strangers that I was not alone. And sexual assault happened in so many different ways. And so I began to write about other characters, which ended up having a lot of relevance to other people's lives. So in a way, it did end up raising awareness. But I think it's important to say that this happens to men as well. And the more we place women at the center of the narrative of sexual assault, the harder it is for men to utter anything that has happened to them. So that was also why it was important for me to write Kwame Story, who is a man in the show who is sexually assaulted. Who did you talk to? No one, really. I just reported it. And boy, oh. that was enough to put me off ever mentioning it to anyone ever again. When I write, I'm just writing, and I hadn't even given the actual physical shooting of a lot of those scenes thought. So I'd seen an article about this woman called Ita O'Brien, who was an intimacy director, coordinator, and she makes the space safe. She gives actors room to kind of understand consent with touch, knowing where we can touch, where people don't want to be touched. Um, there's all these like protective underwear so that we feel safe making close contact and uh, no lines are crossed. I think a lot of the time when we talk about intimacy coordinators or therapists, we think about the actors and it's the crew that are standing there watching that happen and you don't know how harmful that might be for people to witness live as well as experience acting. So we also had Lou Platt who is a therapist and she was on call every single day of the shoot for the crew, for the actors, for the producers, for anybody that wanted to talk. I didn't want anybody to leave my set feeling um, triggered and un uncared for. Yeah. Yes, yes, he made a mistake. Sure, nobody gives a fuck that it's a mistake, Terry. We all make those. Do we make deceitful, destructive, narcissistic, sick, inconsiderate mistakes? Mm, no. I don't know how to not find the humor in tragedy. I definitely didn't go out of my way to make I May Destroy You humorous. The humor to the show was always there, whether I wanted it to be or not. The point in hand is that, as you know, sex with men is not safe for me right now after being sexually assaulted by one of them. So I'd like to have sex with a, a female. A female. I'm dead. My brother's dick. My brother's dick. My brother's dick. <laughs> Boobs and a vag. Boobs and a vag. Boobs and a vag. Your nostrils are flaring. <laughs> You're disgusting! <laughs> I'm definitely in everything that I do trying to engage with society, trying to talk about the world that we are living in right now, um, to get us talking about that, to try and contribute to doing something positive uh, in people's lives. And so to be awarded this and to be uh, counted among these other shows and documentaries is, is wonderful. Yeah, I watched a lot of TV growing up. Knight Rider and A-Team and I loved MASH. I watched a lot of MASH. The Poirot was on, you could not talk in our house. As Period. a child, you yeah. were just watching Murder, She Wrote? Not Murder, She Wrote. Agatha Christie, like Hercule Poirot, like, <laughs> like Masterpiece Theater or... Um, I watched all of the Nova shows. Like, I watch PBS all the time. I watched pretty much every show, any show with a car chase. So Knight Rider and A-Team and The Fall Guy, like Magnum P.I. I had a television show that I really liked. It was The Dukes of Hazard, And that was because it had, like, the car energy in it. And it, and it had, like, jumping over things. And <laughs> it felt like what Fast and Furious is now. Not how to say. Right, right. Now because that, would, that helped. <laughs> Daisy Duke helped. <laughs> us. You gave us false hope. You told us 
that the future was something to look forward to. I'm Greta is a documentary about the Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg. It actually follows her during her first year of activism and gives a behind the scenes look at a marvelous year in a very young activist's life. We have not taken to the streets for you to take selfies with us and tell us that you really admire what we do. We children are doing this for you to put your differences aside and start acting as you would in a crisis. We children are doing this because we want our hopes and dreams back. Like many documentaries, this started with a tip actually. A friend of mine knew Greta's family a little bit and told me that she was going to do some small manifestation outside the Swedish parliament. So I went down to do a recce to see kind of who she was and if she was an interesting character and quickly understood that she had a very special way of speaking about uh, climate change and environmental issues. So I started to follow her and uh, quickly she became more and more famous and, uh, and this became a, a very kind of big documentary. There has now been strikes on, on every continent except Antarctica. Uh, but I think that is amazing that it's, it's not just in Western Europe, it's everywhere. I felt from early on that Greta, with her way of seeing the world, maybe because she also has this diagnosis Asperger's, had a special way of looking at climate change. Uh, she was really interested in the details. Today, we use 100 million barrels of oil every day. There are no politics to change that. There are no rules to keep that oil in the ground. But if being carbon neutral does not include transportation, shopping, food, aviation and shipping, then it doesn't really mean that much. So it's been both reactions around climate change and empowering kind of people to understand that they can make a difference, but also a lot, I think, about uh, neurodiversity and how important it is for us to be inclusive and to have different kinds of people in the public space. It's not that I, I should take the focus because that's what's so good about this movement, that everyone is equally no, no, it's right, but everybody's doing great jobs locally in every country. But you're like that that girl that started it all, you know? Mm -hmm. I think we needed this kind of story that you told, like a story of that everyone can make a difference and that we as like young people can change something. And we needed the story to tell to other people and they saw it, so it's, yeah, it's really nice. Together we can make a difference. With this film, I was very interested in getting inside Greta's head. Uh, and my objective then became to kind of lower the camera and to, to her eye level and try to see how does Greta see the world. Some would say we are wasting less than time. We say we are changing the world. So that when we are older, we will be able to look back and say that we did everything we could. And we will continue to do so. She, as a very young person, has, you know, evolved uh, from being a kind of a shy activist sitting in this small street in Sweden to uh, handling big meetings with the highest political elite. In a few weeks, school will end. And I've been invited to attend the United Nations Climate Summit in New York. And since time is running out, I have decided to go there. I think there's many things with this project that I didn't expect. Uh, and I think one of them was definitely that I didn't expect to sail over the Atlantic Ocean in a carbon fiber racing boat. And since I don't fly because of the enormous climate impact of aviation, it's going to be a challenge. We need to remember that the boat that Greta sailed to uh, the US with, it's not like a luxury yacht, it's just like a carbon fiber hull. Uh, so it was a very special journey, uh, very bumpy. I think the year when I followed Greta, uh, it was a little bit like a pressure cooker in the sense that things, uh, you know, got bigger and bigger all the time, about her impact, but also the attacks on her. And I think when that culminated into her sailing journey, there was so much kind of uh, pressure on her and onto the movement. So in that way, the journey became almost like a metaphor. And in the end, she kind of went to the U US and held this speech, which became Iconic. If you refuse to listen to me, I am, after all, just a 16-year-old schoolgirl from Sweden. 
But you cannot ignore the science. We are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. Erosion of fertile topsoil. Different. Deforestation of our great forests, toxic air pollution, loss of insects and wildlife, the acidification of our oceans. These are all disastrous trends being accelerated by a way of life that we, here in our financially fortunate part of the world, see as our right to simply carry on. I think it's such a beautiful thing to, to know that that climate change and this film about Greta is, is being honored and that people feel that this, this film has moved them and, and made them understand Greta and, and cl the climate movement better. Uh, and that just makes me, makes me so happy and it strengthens me uh, for continuing my work on doing films on these uh, issues because uh, we don't have that much time to make people understand how important climate change and envir environmental degradation is. And I really believe that cinema and TV has a really important role in playing in making people understand these issues in an emotional way. And getting this honorary is, is, is such an important thing to highlight that those films are needed. I remember everything at the beginning of the pandemic, everything at the end, and almost nothing in the middle. One of the first things I watched was Tiger King. That was just the everything that everyone was watching. So I watched Tiger King, I watched Queen's Gambit, the Britney documentary. I was just eager to talk to anybody about anything, so I just made sure to watch any show that other people were watching. I never watched that documentary series about t the tiger guy. <laughs> like, I, you know, I, I, I fell woefully behind. One day, one day I'll watch Tiger King. During quarantine, I kind of watch the same things. A lot of people watch like Tiger King, but actually I watched a lot of South Park and ridiculousness. Are you trying to sell your home but can't get a good price because you black? You're trying to get a new house, but these real estate agents are keeping you in the poor house. Well, pack that moving van, because Leo's got a plan. <laughs> Introducing Leo Deblin's home whiteification. The Daily Show is a show that talks about the news, uses comedy as a tool to filter all the information that is coming in. I'll make your house look so white, they'll think Wes Anderson live in this bitch. And then tries to get into some of the trickier conversations about the why. We don't always find the answers, but I think sometimes having the conversation is one of the most important things that you can do when it comes to some of the trickier topics that people haven't solved. I think when people call The Daily Show a news show, it's a compliment to the way Trevor has crafted hiding the humor. But every morning, it's about where's the joke? We know where the pain is. We know where the tragedy is. You can find that and talk about that all day. Our first instinct is to come up with what's funny about it. And we talk about all the different angles that there are jokes uh, to make about it. We talk about what about it angers or depresses or upsets us and what is funny about those emotions. And then we start thinking about how we want to use those jokes that come out of those feelings to say something. When the pandemic started and black people started calling it the Roni, are we in a pandemic? No, we're in a Panasonic, we're in a- Parmesan. Right, we're in a Parmesan, we're in a Panda Express. The first thing we did was make a joke about it because that's how we have coped with being an oppressed group in America. And even after slavery ended, our hair was still not allowed to be free because in its natural state, Black hair was seen as unkempt and unacceptable in white America's spaces. Why? It's round. It's so round. Their hair just grows to the sky. We've been able to, as a show, disseminate information to people who just want to understand. You know, I think that Trevor being in the seat at The Daily Show, it gives black people an opportunity to go, that's what I've been trying to tell you. If you are a black person or a minority, or a poor person in many places around the world, in London, Berlin, Seoul, Cape Town, you understand what it means to be a target of the police and a target of a system that is designed to keep you down with violence if necessary. And that's why you now have people in every country standing together.
standing together to say, this is not acceptable anymore. Black lives matter. The Daily Show does a really good job of elevating marginalized voices and undercovered stories. One of the things I'm truly grateful for at The Daily Show is that we've managed to continuously grow how diverse our staff is. There's almost no story out there that we cannot draw upon our staff for insight or for jokes or for ideas. Trevor gives everybody space to be themselves and bring the issues that they feel are important to the table, and he considers them. The ifs keep on changing. If you didn't resist arrest, you would still be alive. Or if you didn't run away from the cops, you would still be alive. Well, if you didn't have a toy gun and were 12 years old in the middle of a park, then you would have still been alive. Well, you know what? If you weren't wearing a hoodie, you would have still been alive. Well, you know, if you didn't talk back to the cops, you would have still been alive. If you weren't sleeping in your bed as a black woman, you would have still been alive. There's one common thread beyond all the ifs. If you weren't black, maybe you'd still be alive. If you're not careful, the news will always tell you that the world isn't just ending, but it's already ended and you're living in the apocalypse. And yet when you go outside, birds are still singing and, and flowers are still growing and people are still smiling. And so it doesn't mean that, that nothing is going wrong in the world, but I think there's oftentimes an exaggerated idea of how bad everything is because that's what gets people watching. What I'm always trying to do is just live in a space where The Daily Show engages people in some sort of thought. You may agree with me, you may disagree with me, but I hope I at least leave you thinking when you walk away. What happened to Breonna Taylor, it's not just a few bad cops. It's not even really just about the cops. It's also the legislature that gave them the power to break into houses, the judge that signed the warrant, the police department that didn't act against these officers, and the county that charged the protesters for challenging these rules. In other words, what happened to Breonna Taylor wasn't a failure of the system. It was the system working as it's intended. And that is why people are fighting for the system to be changed. To be honored with this award really underscores the idea that what we're doing matters. I'm eternally grateful, I'm appreciative, and I think it encourages me to try and consistently live in a space where I don't think that I've arrived, and I don't think that the show is the best, and I don't think that it can't get better, because I think at that point, you know, that's that's when you have to stop. If I just get like yes. a little copy of one, maybe like a Times Square that version. That would be nice. Um, miniature. Yeah, you can give me a miniature. Just spell my name right. It can only be, it could be just my first name if there's not enough space on the plate. But yeah, I just need to have something. I know y'all got the money for it too. All these cameras, look at all these nice cameras and mm -hmm. microphones. And, and we didn't even have a full ceremony. You got money for all this, but you ain't got no money to give us no miniature trophy. We on the show too. Think about a little nasty chicken they ain't have to buy because we have to be in some type of ballroom or some stupid it's situation. It's cool. They're not going to give pleasure. us a trophy. They're going to no, give it no, to Trevor. No, 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 Ain't nobody eating no rubbery chicken with no dry mushroom sauce. I need a trophy. I got to send something to my mom. They're not going to give us one. No, I ain't getting a trophy. The Television Academy congratulates once again all of the 2021 Television Academy honorees. Thank you for all your valued work and contributions to our world.